Prova radio microfono, prova radio microfono. So, good morning everybody and a very warm welcome to our guests on behalf of all our university academic community. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to host here in Trento at our university the president of the International Criminal Court 
Mr. Sang Kyung Song to discuss the challenges that the court is facing in a time of global transfor transformations in the social, political, and economic arena. Our university, and especially our School of International Studies, has a long-standing interest in the role and the work of the court as testified by the organizations of three international conferences in 1991, in 2001, and 2007, and by the publication of their proceedings. More recently, students and staff had, ne, had the opportunity to meet uh, the vice presidents of the court, Kuno Tafusa, and, uh, and Judge uh, Sylvia Steiner, and uh, Deputy Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda. By means of such events, the School of International Studies allows us to deepen our insight and in complex but challenging features, fields as international uh, humanitarian and criminal law, human rights and the rights of women, children and migrants, crimes against individuals and the states, including terrorism, crimes aga against public administration, such as extortion and corruption, uh, and organized crime, such as money laundering, just to mention but a few. I'm also glad that uh, Mrs. Stefania Rosini, Deputy Director uh, General for Legal Affairs, Diplomatic Disputes and International Agreements of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs accepted our invitation, thus strengthening the fruitful relationship between our university and the ministry. Finally, I would like to thank Professor Luisa Antonioli, Director of the School of International Studies, and of course, Professor Mauro Politi, former judge of the ICC, for making this event possible and providing us such an opportunity to meet and share ideas, broaden our horizons, and enjoy the experience and points of view of our invited speakers. I wish you all an, an enjoyable and memorable, memorable lecture. Thank you all. Well, um, just really very, very few words because um, the rector has already pointed out the framework. Uh, this is a to. Uh, say to uh, Prof President Song how glad we are to have him here. Uh, exactly, almost exactly one year ago uh, at the School of International Studies, we had the prosecutor, uh, Mrs. Bensuda, coming and uh, talking to us, and the student and, and the public has participated actively in the discussion, showing that this is a theme that is particularly relevant for the student community of the School of International Studies, um, of the University of Trento in general, and for the public. So um, we're particularly glad that we can have a, another occasion on which views can be exchanged and you can have a first-hand uh, knowledge of what is happening at, at the international scene. And of course, this is a particularly important time where uh, criminal justice and the need for ensuring criminal justice at the world level is felt. So I'm particularly grateful to uh, you for coming here, to pr um, President Song, to Dr. Stefania Rosini, and let me say um, to Mauro Politi, who has been made uh, all of this possible. So um, thank you for coming, and um, uh, Professor Politi, you have the floor. Many thanks and good morning to everybody. <coughs> First of all, uh, Madam Rector, President Song, uh, distinguished professors uh, and uh, guests, 
allow me to uh, convey the regrets of Mr. Tuitico not to be uh, being here this morning because uh, uh, some of this uh, procedural uh, um, issue has to be addressed in Rome after the new government uh, uh, starting this morning to work. So uh, it's now to me and with very great uh, pleasure to, in this occasion of this very important Lectio Magistralis, to bring you the best wishes of the new Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, for a fruitful day of study and debate in such an important moment of the life of the International Criminal Court. I look around me and I see a lot of young people, so I know that they are supporters, natural supporters of the court. Uh, and for sure, we don't need to spend a lot of time uh, recalling the importance of the ICC and its mandate. Just simply uh, looking at the 1998, at that uh, 17th of July, when the Rome Statute was adopted, many concurred in thinking that the institutional importance of the event has, been, has to be compared with the approval of the United Nations Charter. Subsequently, all of, all of us know of it, of course, the court has performed its high judicial functions for many years with dedication and effectiveness in order to prosecute and punish the perpetrators of atrocities such as acts of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Sharing its objectives, Italy, of course, I would say, uh, fully supports the court. For the last 20 years, and particularly after the adoption of the Rome Statute, the court has been on the agenda of the Italian foreign policy as a priority for its essential role in promoting peace and protecting human rights through the punishment of the most heinous crimes. For this reason, the universality of the Rome Statute remains, remains one of the fundamental objectives of the entire process which led to the establishment of the International Criminal Court. The results achieved so far through the ratification of and the accession to the Rome Statute have been remarkable. 122 states from all the regions are now parties to the Statute. And this number proves that geographical distance doesn't matter when it comes to putting an end to mass atrocities. However, all of us are aware that there is still a lot to be done in uh, that respect. And Italy is fully engaged in promoting further acceptance of the Rome Statute system. This is in line with the position of the European uh, Union, of course, and is pursued in coordination with the all the initiatives and actions undertaken by the EU for increasing the number of state parties. Furthermore, wider acceptance of the Rome Statute means also strengthening the ICC role of preventive diplomacy. And this is uh, something for us very, very important to achieve. The International Criminal Court has seen a constant increase of its authority and credibility and has become the centerpiece of a new justice paradigm. Nevertheless, today, this important achievement and the role of the court itself could be questioned by the problems arisen over the last period. We believe that difficulties sometimes should be faced with courage and determination, the firm belief that hard moments may also become great opportunities of further growth and reaffirmation, in our case, of the value of this institution. On July 2014, as the Italian presidency of the Council of European uh, Union will start, Italy will chair the legal council group on the International Criminal Court. In that occasion, the Italian government will continue to testify its full and reserved support to international criminal justice, and in particular to the court as a fundamental key institution in the fight against impunity for the most atrocious crimes. Italy has always been in the forefront of the development of systems of international criminal justice and of the fight against impunity for international crimes. In doing that, we have been constantly inspired by our tradition and legal heritage. 
and by our belief that only the adoption of widely accepted rules punishing the most heinous crimes and to be applied by an independent and impartial judicial body could respond to the increasing demand for justice and prevent future atrocity. Today, the council life seems to be at a crossroad. We know and uh, we have uh, to support all its efforts in order to going on, keeping our engagement. So just looking at this situation, allow me in conclusion, Madam Rector, uh, uh, to say that uh, I deeply appreciate the topic of this, uh, uh, of this lecture. We know the challenges, but we know also how could be the remedy we have to find out together. Cooperation with court should uh, be strengthened and its credibility as an essential institution for the international order has to be supported and improved through concrete steps. It would be the right way for all of us to remain faithful to the vision we had 16 years ago when we adopted the Rome Statute to meet the demand for justice and the refusal of impunity of the gravest, gravest international crimes. I don't want to take more of your time because I think we have more interesting things to do listen. And I thank you very much. And uh, again, have a good work, a nice day. Uh, bon lavoro. Thanks. Just a few words from me, President Song. We are uh, truly delighted to have you uh, with us in Trento National Studies, to have you with our faculty and especially with our students. Your visit has also a special meaning for me, for someone who had the opportunity, the chance, and the honor to work with you uh, for a number of years. Those were pioneering years for the ICC, and uh, I'm sure that Judge Song remembers how exciting it was to do the groundwork to establish the authority and credibility of the court. And I have to say that I immediately realized that Judge Song could be an excellent, excellent leader for uh, the court when the challenges would become even more uh, difficult. He, he will remember that at some point he, s he ran for the vice presidency of the court. And I, I was one of those who voted for him at that time. I'm sure he did not forget that. I knew that when the challenges would have become more difficult, we needed some leadership. And the leadership could be provided by, by Judge Stone. Now, we will talk about these challenges that are now before the court, and I'm sure that Judge Song will be very candid and adamant in explaining what are the challenges and what are the answers that the uh, court or the court uh, could provide. Uh, I'm extremely optimistic, I have to say, in the future of the court. The court is there to stay and to stay strong as it is uh, now. Uh, there are temporary uh, difficulties, but again, talking about the leadership of the court, and, ev and I've, I was even more convinced uh, of this when last fall I was in New York and uh, Judge Song was delivering uh, an incredible, uh, a great speech before the Assembly of States Party in a moment which is, was probably the most difficult moment that uh, the court uh, uh, had to go through and the image of the court for the reasons that he will explain when he will speak. At that time, I saw realism, vision, dedication in your speech, and I was very proud of my president. I have to say. Uh, we will talk about challenges, and, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not here to uh, discuss them beforehand. We, I'll wait for Judge Song to explain what the challenges are. But obviously, I'm sure it will touch upon the African issue and the difficult relationship between the court, the African states, and the African Union. This is an issue that has 
consumed, if I can say, the energy of all of those who have been dealing with the ICC, especially in the last uh, two uh, months. Uh, I don't want to say more because I'm sure it's one of the issues that will be touched upon by Judge uh, Song. And uh, it would be interesting to hear what he thinks of the fact that Strangely enough, the court has been accused recently of not being politically sensitive enough. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> calling a judicial uh, body to be politically sensitive is, uh, is something very strange, but this is one of the issues that uh, Judge Song had to deal with. I'm sure it will touch upon the universality of the court the question of cooperation and the question of complementarity. Uh, I don't want to say more now. I just thank him very, very much. Uh, I said I would be forever grateful for him uh, for coming to Trento and uh, uh, give my students, our students, the opportunity to have a dialogue with him. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so now the floor is for President Song. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. It is a great pleasure for me to be here in Trento, in one of the, the leading universities in this country. I would like to thank First of all, the University of uh, Trento for hosting me today. You know, I always try to accept the invitations to talk to students. You see, for more than 30 years, I was a professor of law, and wherever I have the opportunity, I'm happy to return for a moment to the academic world where I always feel at home. I love talking to students and being inspired by uh, their energy and enthusiasm. I'm also glad to see uh, <coughs> uh, my old friend actually there should be two old friends, uh, uh, Professor Nezi and Judge Politi, but uh, I know uh, Professor Nezi is now out of town, but uh, Professor Nezi and I met more than a 10 years ago. <coughs> it was in New York when uh, he was working at the permanent mission of Italy to the United Nations. And I traveled there for the first ever election of the judges to the International Criminal Court, um, I think early in 2003. I was eventually elected, as was uh, also my dear friend uh, Mauro Politi. Judge Politi <coughs> and I were colleagues for six years. He was in charge, among other things, of carrying out a substantial research on the complementarity of the ICC and national jurisdictions. His diligence on the work, on the task, earned him the title of Mr. Complementarity. And um, I also want to thank uh, Professor uh, Antonioli for uh, the warm hospitality and uh, Madame Rodini for, for your kindness um, of coming all the way from Rome despite your busy schedules. 
before I talk about the ICC, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am from South Korea. During the 1950s, we had a war in Korea that tore apart the entire country. Most of you in this room were born long after that, but you might have studied or read about the Korean War. I was a child at the time, and I remember vividly the horrific experience of living in a humid um, underground bunker in Seoul during the three months of the communist, communist occupation, emerging every day to walk maybe 16 or 20 kilometers um, simply to collect food for my entire family, passing decomposing corpse on the way. Going through this experience inculcated in me a, a, a lifelong aversion toward war and violence. And I am profoundly grateful that you as young people today do not have to go through what I did. Thankfully, the war ended uh, three years later, and uh, I was able to grow up uh, in relative peace and prosperity, a privilege that I have always been deeply thankful for. Regrettably, there are still far too many parts of the world today in which peace simply remains an unattainable luxury. As president of the ICC, I have met with victims in countries like Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Some were former child soldiers grappling to rebuild their lives, to regain their human dignity. Other victims were missing arms or legs or lips or ears and or noses, nose which had been intentionally cut off. The brutality they suffered reminded me that Unfortunately, with so many countries caught up in conflict, we are far from eradicating depravity and mass violence. Those of us who are granted the blessing of uh, peace and safety from this horrific violence must always ask them ourselves what we can do with this gift. I chose a legal career, and I have believed all my life that it is through law that the worst violence and cruelty inflicted upon humans can be prevented. This is the same belief that has guided the development of international criminal justice through the 20th century. After the Second World War, the world articulated an unparalleled claim for justice. From the death and destruction, a powerful movement emerged 
to hold people individually accountable for the crimes that they committed. Tribunals were set up in Nuremberg and Tokyo and perpetrators were brought to justice. In this judgment, the Nuremberg Tribunal famously stated that crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities, and that only by punishing these individuals can the provisions of international law be enforced. In addition, the United Nations and the International Court of Justice were established to enable cooperation between states and the peaceful settlement of disputes. Unfortunately, the idea at the time to establish a permanent international criminal court was a sad victim of the Cold War rivalry and for a half century, the very idea lay dormant. Decades later, the end of the Cold War opened a new era in which justice was suddenly in high demand. With the East-West Division no longer paralyzing the UN Security Council as it had in the past, the Security Council was able to set up ad hoc international criminal tribunals to prosecute perpetrators of genocide and other atrocities that had occurred in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. This gave a significant boost to the idea of establishing a permanent international criminal court, which had resurfaced in the UN General Assembly in the year 1989. After a few years of intense negotiations, the international community came together in the summer of 1998 to fulfill a promise that had been 50 years in the making. Delegates from 160 countries gathered in Rome to negotiate an international treaty that formed the statute for the world's first permanent international criminal court. On the 17th of July, 1998, the Rome statute was adopted. Finally, giving life to the commitment to end the impunity. Four years later, the 60th ratification was deposited and the ICC was established as a new permanent international organization independent of the United Nations or any other body. The new court was given a mandate to investigate and prosecute genocide, war crimes, and crimes against the humanity. This mandate is the legal representation of the international community's promise, its commitment to the victims of these crimes that impunity will not be tolerated. The International Criminal Court is the product of a shared, a shared global commitment, a promise that has been made and broken too many times throughout history. 
every time we see the most horrific crimes committed, the world says never again and promises that the next time will be different and we will not have to apologize again to victims for action that is too little, too late. Ladies and gentlemen, currently the ICC is conducting more proceedings involving more suspects than ever before. The court has so far undertaken a total of 19 cases in eight country situations. Two situations were referred to us by the UN Security Council, Darfur, Sudan, and Libya. Two initiated by the prosecutor, Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire, and four referred to us by states themselves, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Central African Republic, and Mali. The ICC prosecutor is conducting further eight preliminary examinations across five continents. Among them are Afghanistan, Georgia, Honduras, and Korean Peninsula. The first two trial judgments, one conviction and one acquittal, are currently on appeal before me. Allegations against defendants include heinous crimes such as the use of child soldiers, attacks against civil populations, and sex slavery. There are 18 judges at the ICC responsible for conducting the proceedings of the court. And they are divided into three divisions, the pretrial division, the trial division, and the appeals division. One of the current pretrial judges is Italian, that is Judge Kuno Tafuso from Bolzano. He's also serving at the second vice president of the court. The Rome Statute guarantees both a geographical balance and a gender balance within the ICC's pool of judges at any given time. In fact, at the moment, the majority of the judges of the ICC are women. A male judge like me might soon be endangered species. The ICC's uh, registry has so far uh, provided legal representation for more than 7,500 victims who were granted the right to participate in the criminal proceedings to express their views and concerns. The Trust Fund for Victims is now supporting over 110,000 victims of crime under the jurisdiction of the ICC through physical and psychological rehabilitation and material support at both the individual and community levels. All in all, I am very proud of what we have achieved in the ICC's first 10 years. What, do, 
what used to be an abstract idea has been turned into a busy, thriving international judicial institution that is conducting its mandate with professionalism and integrity, backed by the strong support of the international community. But despite all this progress, we must recognize that the ICC also faces significant challenges and obstacles. Today, I would like to share with you four of these uh, challenges that, in my view, are main areas of opportunity to achieve a more effective and efficient system of international criminal justice. Let me start with challenge number one, universality. The effectiveness of the ICC is very much dependent upon the ratification status of the Rome Statute. The more states uh, join forces under the umbrella of the Rome Statute, the greater effect the evolving system of international criminal justice can have. There are several reasons for this. Firstly, the ICC only has a territorial jurisdiction in the state's parties to the statute. Even the most heinous crimes are out of bound for the ICC if committed on the territory of non-state parties. Secondly, state parties have a legal obligation, treaty obligation, to cooperate fully with the ICC as opposed to non-state parties which are not bound by the treaty. Consequently, the more states join the Rome Statute, the greater will be the ability of the ICC, for example, to access uh, witnesses, to obtain evidence, or to have suspects arrested anywhere in the world. In the case of international crimes, witnesses are frequently dispersed in many different countries as refugees. Thirdly, the expansion of the ICC's membership will positively affect the global legitimacy of the ICC and the normative effect of the Rome Statute. The increasing inclusiveness of the Rome Statute system will reduce the room for accusations of selectivity in the court's operations. Ratification of the Rome Statute by one state, especially if it is a large and influential or populous uh, country, will often encourage others to consider enhancing their support for the ICC as well. Unfortunately, the pace of new ratifications has slowed down in the last two years. We went from four in 2010 and six in 2011 to only one state joining in 2012 and another one in 2013. As president of the ICC, 
I have personally invested considerable amount of time and efforts in promoting universality of the Rome Statute, particularly in the Asia Pacific, which remains severely underrepresented among states parties. Currently, I see a potential, especially in Southeast Asia, where several countries, um, notably uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, have expressed, indicated their intention to accede to the Rome Statute. However, some persistent obstacles remain often due to uh, ignorance or misunderstanding. For example, concerning the principles of non-retroactivity and complementarity enshrined in the Rome Statute. Clarifying these matters in discussions with relevant uh, decision makers, as well as uh, through uh, public advocacy, is very crucial for uh, progress to occur. Non-state parties uh, should be encouraged to consider the question of the ratifying the Rome Statute, mm -hmm. not only from a very narrow national point of view, but from a wider perspective, viewing the ICC as a community where participation carries benefits, not only for their citizens, but also for humanity as a whole. Above all, joining the ICC is a powerful measure for strengthening international peace, security, and the rule of law, and helping prevent impunity for the gravest crimes of concern to the international community, community as a whole. Ratification of the Rome Statute is an act of international solidarity and cooperation, reflecting the notion that global problems require collective solutions. I will now move on to challenge number two, complementarity and the strengthening of national jurisdictions. The Rome Statute created much more than a court. The ICC is the centerpiece of a new evolving international criminal justice system that consists of two main levels, one at national jurisdiction as the first line of defense against impunity, and another one at the ICC as a fail-safe option, a court of last resort. The two levels of justice that complement each other forming a novel international structure intended to ensure accountability for the gravest crimes. Under the Rome Statute, the ICC can exercise jurisdiction over a matter only if domestic legal systems have failed to investigate or prosecute. If a state can demonstrate that it is genuinely doing uh, 
this job, the ICC must defer to the national jurisdiction. This is the judicial aspect of this principle of complementarity. In order to achieve an effective complementarity, it is crucial to strengthen national capacities as well as encourage states to assume ownership of the domestic judicial processes. Making the principle of complementarity fully effective remains one of the greatest challenges for creating a truly credible and comprehensive system of deterrence and prevention against atrocity crimes. The domestic justice systems of states should be so well equipped to deal with Rome statute crimes that they can serve as the primary deterrent worldwide. For the evolving mechanism of international criminal justice to be further strengthened, commitment and resolute action is needed from a broad range of stakeholders. Among these are included national authorities, the Assembly of States Party to the Rome Statute, the United Nations, international rule of law and development assistance agencies, regional organizations, professional associations, and civil society organizations. In this sense, we can see a vast interconnected web of actors emerging with the power to solidify the progress that the world has made during the last century in adopting and implementing legal norms against the mass violence and inhumane act. Legal norms that are based on fundamental human values shared by the international community as a whole. The role of the ICC itself in the strengthening of national jurisdictions is rather limited as the court is neither a training academy nor an economic aid giving agency. However, the ICC sits at the apex of the evolving interconnected system of international criminal justice and has taken center stage in symbolizing and promoting a global vision of the fight against impunity through accountability. A vast amount of work remains to be done to achieve the necessary strengthening of national <laughs> jurisdictions. A large number of ICC states parties have yet to incorporate Rome statute crimes into their national criminal code. Where large scale crimes have occurred, their effective investigation and prosecution frequently presents enormous challenges for post-conflict societies in terms of human resources, technical capabilities, and specialized skills, among other things. It is vital that international assistance recognizes, supports, 
justice and accountability as an integral element of conflict recovery and the building a stable future. Next, challenge number three, cooperation. The cooperation of states parties is a cornerstone of the ICC ability to fulfill its mandate. When creating the ICC, states decided to devise a two-pillar system. The ICC serves as the judicial pillar, while states act as the enforcement pillars. Indeed, the ICC has no enforcement mechanism of, of its own, and it would be powerless without the cooperation of states in areas such as access to crime scenes, obtaining documentary evidence, locating witnesses, and arresting suspects. While cooperation is generally forthcoming, it is not always problem free. Lack of cooperation generates delays in judicial proceedings. These delays may result in increasing operational costs and diminishing the ICC's ability to deliver justice in the eyes of the victim. In a worst case scenario, justice may be denied altogether due to lack of cooperation. For instance, if arrest warrants are not carried out or court is not uh, granted access to key evidence. The failure to arrest persons suspected of having committed crimes under the jurisdiction of the ICC may fuel the perception that impunity is permissible, encouraging potential future perpetrators to commit atrocities. This would weaken the effectiveness of the Rome Statute system, undermine the ISIS's credibility, and seriously risk eroding its deterrent effect. Unfortunately, the reality is that several ICC arrest warrants have still remained outstanding for years, including against well-known persons such as Mr. Joseph Kony and the President Omar al-Bashir. Essentially, the ICC needs to be able to rely on a sturdy framework of public and diplomatic support strong enough to ensure that states parties comply with their legal obligations to cooperate with the ICC. This framework would also reinforce the ICC's legitimacy and effectiveness when carrying out its judici judicial and prosecutorial activities. It is also vital that states adopt necessary domestic legislation to regulate all forms of cooperation with the ICC. Italy took quite some time to do this, but finally passed the legislation 
in December 2012. And many of the state's parties, however, are yet to do so. Last but uh, not least, let me discuss challenge number four, efficiency. The gravest international crime, crimes are inherently complex in nature and their proper investigation, prosecution, and adjudication requires significant time and resources. For this reason, international criminal justice is not cheap, nor is it fast. This challenge is all the greater when considering the vast territorial scope of the ICC's mandate. The ICC is already dealing with eight country situations and the number could increase in the future. The physical distance between the court seats in the Netherlands and the crime locations in the various situation countries necessarily adds to the cost of the ICC's proceedings due to the travel and other logistical arrangements that are required for investigation, testimony, and other operations. With 18 judges sitting in benches of three at pretrial and trial, and as a bench of five on appeal, the ICC can only hear a very limited number of cases simultaneously at any given uh, moment. This creates tremendous demand for efficiency so that the ICC can complete cases in a reasonable time frame while not jeopardizing the quality or fairness of the proceedings. The first trials of the ICC have not been easy. The statute and the rules of procedure and evidence were put to the real test of practice for the first time. The parties disagreed on numerous fundamental issues which had to be eventually resolved through complex interlocutory appeals. After the court's first decade, the judges were satisfied with having created jurisprudence on a number of important legal issues and having successfully safeguarded the fairness of the court process, but we also felt strongly that we must try to speed up and streamline the ICC's uh, judicial work. As soon as the uh, ICC's first trial concluded in April 2012, I did not waste a single day in launching a lessons learned exercise in order to identify procedural innovations that could expedite the criminal process. I put the first vice president, Judge Sanji Monageng of Botswana, in charge of leading this particular exercise. The judges on the basis of their personal experience of the proceedings, did produce a very large number of suggestions and ideas for improving the efficiency of the ICC's uh, judicial proceedings. We sorted out, uh, categorized these ideas, and we formed a working group on lessons learned to look in more detail at these proposals in the areas identified as being most crucial. Let me explain the process through which 
an idea coming from the judges has to go through in order to become law. Once the working group is satisfied with the proposal to amend the rules of procedure and evidence, this working group will transfer that to the ICC's Advisory Committee on Legal Text for further consideration. Here, only here, the other organs of the court, including prosecution and defense, will have an opportunity to make comments. If an amendment proposal passes this stage, it is then transmitted to a subsidiary body of the Assembly of States Parties called the Study Group on Governance. Here, the states parties can engage in an interactive dialogue with the ICC regarding the amendment proposal and the reasoning behind it. This is important for making sure that the states and the ICC understand and agree with each other. The study group then conveys any views on the, on the mentioned in recommendations on amending the rules of procedure and evidence to the working group on lessons learned, another subsidiary organ of the Assembly of States Parties, which is formally in charge of preparing amendment proposals for the consideration of the Assembly of States Parties. This coordinated process involving both the ICC and the states parties has already produced three sets of amendments to the rules of procedure that were adopted during the last two sessions of the assembly. Many more amendments are now in the pipeline. As you can see, the judges of the ICC have fully recognized the need to improve the efficiency of the ICC's proceedings. After all, the judges are the ones with the detailed first-hand knowledge of how the rules of procedure and evidence work in practice, and they are uniquely placed to make proposals as to where the existing legal framework could be adjusted in order to speed up the process without sacrificing procedural fairness. But even with improved efficiency, the ICC will still need significant financial resources to do the job states parties have given us. Over the last five years, the ICC's caseload has grown significantly faster than its budget. In light of the difficult situation in the global economy, the ICC has gone to previous, uh, previously unforeseen lengths during this period to reduce operational costs, to carefully align activities and the proposed budget to strategic goals, and to responsibly administer the funds which the states parties have provided. It is understandable that ICC's uh, states parties keep a tight rein on the court budget. However, state should balance budgetary discipline with respect for the increasing demands that the ICC faces. The state's parties need to ensure that the ICC is provided with essential resources 
to carry out the mandate it has been entrusted with. To do otherwise would mean letting down all the victims who look to the ICC in hope of justice. We would be sending out a message that perpetrators may get away with atrocity crimes because of uh, um, financial consideration. Enhancing the efficiency of operations and keeping the ICC's overall cost in balance with the available resources while, while not compromising the institution's ability to effectively fulfill its mandate will likely remain a continuous challenge for the ICC. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, the creation of the International Criminal Court just over a decade ago was a moment of heady idealism for many of us who were involved. We were stepping forward into the unknown, armed with the lessons of history that impunity cannot be tolerated and our profound desire to change the world. The ICC has advanced to full speed and the court is now very busy investigating, prosecuting, and adjudicating some of the worst crimes imaginable to mankind. The force of international criminal justice has come a long way, yet we are aware that there is much room for improvement and we face serious challenges. In this lecture, I have mentioned four um, areas which in my view need constant attention, universality, complementarity, cooperation, and efficiency. Perhaps the most important factor for future success is the steadfast and principled commitment of, of the state parties to support the work of the ICC, to provide full cooperation and the necessary resources for its operations while respecting the ICC's independence and to make the Rome Statute stronger and more universal. We will probably never fulfill all of the hopes of all of the people that believe in us. But I am here today to tell you that the ICC has already made a historic difference in articulating a decisive response to the worst crimes known to humankind. The ICC will continue its mission from now into the future as a giant leap forward in the global fight against impunity. That future is your hand. And as the next generation of leaders, I hope that you will never give up trying to change the world for the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was really a, a, a very inspiring uh, lecture. I think um, all of the audience got a sense of what a huge task the court has in front of, uh, of its future development and also uh, how many steps were required 
uh, in order to achieve the result that were achieved. So um, I, I think what is extremely important and interesting to note is the need to have a context. The court is operating in international context, which is very difficult, which has changed over time and is constantly changing. And at the same time, that the technical aspects are so crucial, that how the rules of procedure and evidence are framed, how the uh, cooperation of the judicial apparatuses of the states and of the enforcement agencies are required. So that the task is really a, a very complex one and, and that it requires a number of expertise, but also of the awareness of what are the means and what are the ends. So with that, I think we should open the floor for questions. So anybody of you who's interested can raise their hands and get a micro. Um, I urge you not to be too long so that to give the possibility to everybody to participate with the discussion. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joseph Mendy. I'm from Africa. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, uh, you talked about the diplomatic framework to ensure compliance with uh, the obligation of states to cooperate in times of arresting suspects. That has not been working pretty much well with the court. And I wanted to know if you have any other mechanisms within the Rome Statute to ensure compliance with uh, arrest warrants by state parties. As I indicated in my speech, uh, the Rome Statute provides a no mechanism or enforcement mechanism of uh, ICC's own. So the ICC has to entirely rely on uh, state uh, cooperations. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, technical process of enforcement, once a pretrial chamber issues an arrest warrant and the registrar serves this arrest warrant uh, upon all the state's parties or in certain cases uh, uh, upon some of the non-state's parties um, and um, ask them uh, to have this enforced. Um, it, uh, it has been working that way, uh, but um, certain, as I said, arrest warrants still remain outstanding. However, uh, then uh, you might uh, think, hey, hey then uh, ICC is uh, simply a paper tiger. Mm. You don't have uh, any enforcement mechanism of your own what, what, what else can you do it? But don't forget one thing, however. Since the, the ICC arrest warrants does not know a statute of limitation, once arrest warrant is issued, it is always dangling upon the suspect's head for the rest of his life, regardless of whether he's in power or out of power. So someday, maybe 10 years later, um, he will face justice. Um, in other criminal tribunals, we already saw similar uh, instances. You know, the ICQI was able to arrest uh, a certain suspect 16 years later. It, it, it sometimes it could work that way, but uh, um, it, the at the earlier days of negotiation, the the majority of the uh, dissipating states were. Uh, opposed to uh, the idea of giving the uh, enforcement, enforcement mechanisms to the ICC. So for that reason, we don't have them. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Tara Mansour. I'm a law student at the University of Vienna. And first of all, I wanted to thank you for being so honest today and sharing with us what the problems uh, are that the ICC is facing. I have a question regarding um, the notion that also uh, Professor Politi pointed out that uh, sometimes the ICC is um, very amusingly criticized to be politically insensitive. And I wanted to ask you from your personal um, experiences, how does the ICC manage to balance between um, being a very honest and uh, very professional judicial body and at the same time to be a body that also needs and wants to encourage states to cooperate, uh, states that might be also criticized by decisions of the court or by, by other rulings? Thank you very much. Uh, this is um, um, ongoing uh, challenge. Probably I should have said um, before I um, actually refer to each individual um, um, challenges I identified. The fundamental challenge for the court is that the ICC has to operate in a political world. Can you imagine how difficult uh, it would be for a, a, a purely judicial institution to have to operate in the political world? And um, um, when <coughs> the Rome Statute was negotiated and uh, in the making, um, some big countries were uh, opposed to um, the idea of allowing the UN Security Council to make a referral to the ICC. Um, well there are many reasons based on their national interest, but uh, common reason for this opposition, if I understand correctly, was uh, politicization possibility of the uh, judicial body. So from the beginning, uh, apparently the, the participating uh, states, uh, you know, they recognize this, this possibility. Indeed, um <coughs> yes, uh, we are uh, sometimes uh, attacked uh, politically out of political motivation have seen it a uh, couple of times. Uh, but um, even in those uh, politically difficult times, I am convinced that my job as the president of the uh, International Criminal Court, among other things, should be and would be to keep this uh, judicial institution free from political influence. I am ready to pay any cost to, to keep this, uh, this court uh, free from political influence. And, um, but uh, how would you deal with the uh, political reality? Well, actually, <coughs> since the, the court is a, uh, a so a judicial body has to remain a judicial body as opposed to a political organ. Um, <coughs> the political or disputes or uh, issues of political nature should be dealt with by the state's party, individual state party or assembly of state's parties. Um, they can this ASP, we call it, uh, the Assembly of State Parties, is an uh, oversight mechanism of the court, court operation. They are also a legislative body for the court. And furthermore, in my view, it is a, it is an, a forum where state parties can freely deal with uh, political questions for, for the court. So that way, um, whenever certain pro uh, problem or an issue of political nature arose, 
we've been, uh, I've been sort of uh, maneuvering in that direction, in, in that format, uh, uh, always uh, try to closely uh, uh, consult uh, states parties. This is the problem of political unity. You should uh, deal with uh, this problem for the court and, and, and so on. Can I ask you a question, Judge Strong? Um, you addressed me as Mr. Complementarity. <coughs> Well, I remember, uh, yes, I, I was there together with the group of uh, a paper, actually, a large paper that I don't know where it is. It's probably hidden, hidden in one of the drawers. <laughs> but I, I tried to use it before I left on one point that doesn't seem to be fully understood by states' parties or at least by some states' parties. And the point is that on complementarity, it, there is a judicial process provided for in the statute according to which the court must decide whether the case is admissible or not admissible. It is not sufficient for a state to say, oh, I have a good judicial system, so I do what I want with this case, and I deal with this case. This doesn't seem to be fully understood sometimes by by some state parties, and this is a crucial issue. Uh, but my question relates uh, more, uh, um, how can I say, deeply on uh, the issue of positive complementarity. You address this when you say the court is not a body, that it doesn't, it doesn't have the mandate, doesn't have the resources to do the job of helping constituents states to be um, uh, able uh, to, to, to conduct and carry out judicial proceedings. Is that true also for the office of the prosecutor? The office of the prosecutor has been always very attentive to this concept and very sensitive to this. You will remember that one of the first papers that we received from the office of the prosecutor as soon as we started our work in The Hague was a paper in which the then prosecutor would say the best success for the ICC would be not to have even one case because it would mean that uh, national jurisdiction would do their job and we have to do everything we can to help national jurisdiction carry out national proceedings. So we were actually surprised to hear, to hear that, that statement. But the Office of the Prosecutor has always been very keen in conducting and proceeding with, uh, with relationship with states that would help uh, uh, national jurisdictions to, to, to carry out national proceedings on the basis of the concept of positive complementarity. So I would like you to, to tell me within the limits of what you can say. <laughs> I what don't do know much of about uh, what's going on within, uh, within inside the uh, office of the prosecutor. But you see the results and the <laughs> speeches. You see, you see what, what they say. You see what they do. So <laughs> you must have uh, a thought about this. They seem to focus on uh, the African situation countries with an idea of uh, strengthening their... Um, their domestic legal systems uh, with some success, with some, uh, uh, I wouldn't say failure, but uh, you know, just non-success. Um, <coughs> since complementarity has many aspects, uh, the, that positive uh, complementarity uh, may be taken up uh, also by the uh, prosecutor and uh, just uh, um, and that they can the office of the prosecutor can uh, deal with this matter with in the in the situation countries in, in, in particular but uh, generally uh, we we are I mean the ICC as a whole is is doing far more uh, one aspect is uh, just uh, to strengthen the national capacity of the, uh, the, the 
individual state party system and also uh, to persuade as, as many states parties as possible to uh, to conclude a witness protection agreement with the court or uh, the enforcement of sentences agreement with the court we uh, we have been uh, vigorously pursuing this so uh, some states parties in South America or Africa or Eastern Europe uh, or Asia or signed the, the, those agreements with us. This is also, in a way, a part of complementarity activity. Also, uh, um, the certain situation countries created created um, a grant, particular department within their judicial system which is exclusively specialized in war crimes and ICC crimes. And then uh, for that to be successful, uh, our, the Office of the Prosecutor uh, provided some, uh, some various forms of assistance to their operations. Um, I wouldn't name any particular country that are closely working with the uh, Office of the Prosecutor for that purpose. Hello, my name is Alex and I uh, study international studies. I would like to ask you to quickly point to three things. Number one is, how would you respond to criticism that the ICC only prosecutes Africans? Number two is about uh, the, uh, what's his name? How is the, uh, the I see some drawbacks in the Saif al-Islam case, if you know, what I, I know that the ICC asked for him to be sent to The Hague, which was refused by the Libyan authorities. How is this case going, Saif al-Islam? The Libyan. Uh, the son of, yes, the son of Colonel Gaddafi. And number three is would the ICC be considering a prosecution for Yanukovych? Thank you. All right. With respect to the. Um, the first question, why only Africa? Um, it is true that uh, from certain uh, corners of the African continent, we, uh, we, we, we get this uh, criticism. Why do you, ICC, uh, target only um, African countries? Um, <coughs> The out of eight African, uh, out uh, the eight country situations that the ICC uh, has been dealing with are indeed all uh, African countries. And as I indicated uh, earlier, uh, in the case of four African countries, their top government representatives came all the way to The Hague and uh, referred their um, domestic armed conflict situations to the ICC. Um, Mr. ICC, please come forward and help us. We had a terrible armed conflict domestically, but we don't know how to handle this. Please come and help us. That's how the ICC uh, became involved in those four African country situations. And as I said, in the, in the case of Libya and Sudan, they are not even states parties. But the, uh, thanks to the uh, referral made by the uh, uh, Security Council, we, uh, we started uh, 
working on these uh, two country situations. And uh, in the case of Cote d'Ivoire, strictly speaking, it can be classified as, as, um, as a situation uh, <coughs> proprio motu triggered by the ICC prosecutor, but in reality, in reality, what happened was the Cote d'Ivoire came to the court when it wasn't even a state party. They said, we will make a public declaration that Cote d'Ivoire will accept the ICC jurisdiction. It is possible under the, uh, the Rome statute. Non-state party can, can declare to accept acceptance of the uh, ICC jurisdiction. The Cote d'Ivoire uh, did just that. So uh, we, uh, we were, uh, you know, the ICC prosecutor decided to start investigation there. But the, the moment the investigation was uh, started, Cote d'Ivoire uh, just ratified the Rome Statute. It's now a state party. In the case of Kenya, this is uh, really a, a, a situation where uh, ICC prosecutor initiated proprio motu investigation after getting the approval from the pretrial chamber of the ICC. When um, the prosecutors uh, decided to investigate the Kenya situation, um, it was uh, started with full blessing of the Kenyan government at that time, all the Kenyan people's blessing, and all the blessing of the international community. What happened was, Mr. Kofi Annan and Waki and others were uh, given mandate to uh, investigate uh, or mediate or this uh, you know, dispute that, that took place in, in, in inside Kenya. And their final recommendations uh, was that Kenya should be able to deal with uh, these atrocities by themselves domestically. So their suggestion was to submit a, a, a bill to that effect to the Kenyan parliament for adoption and uh, with that disagreement, disagreement uh, inside the uh, Kenyan parliament, the Kenyan parliament twice voted down this international um, recommendations. After that, Mr. Kofi Annan, for example, you know, declared, oh, then there is a no other possibility, no alternative, but to send the case to, to, the, Hague, to the Hague. That's how, uh, and then in response to this uh, uh, sort of uh, declaration, the ICC prosecutor decided to start the investigation in Kenya with full blessings of internal and uh, international communities. Um, my point is that in almost all of these uh, African country situations, the ICC did not deliberately choose only African states and seek out Africa. They all came to us. This is one uh, answer I can give you. And uh, <clears throat> whenever the, we started uh, investigating the situations in, in those countries, one of the first things 
the, the prosecutor does is to make it crystal clear that now, since now you refer the, your situation to us, we will mainly investigate all the atrocities committed by your opponents. However, the mere fact that the government referred their situation to the ICC does not necessarily exempt the government side from being possibly investigated and prosecuted if any evidence is discovered. So it's a first warning every time the uh, prosecutor gives to the situation country. It, in reality, it, it didn't happen so far, but um, <clears throat> we know uh, from certain political factions within a situation country, they uh, generated a strong criticism uh, toward us. Uh, why do you, uh, you know, investigate only uh, the rebels, uh, but not the uh, the government side? I mean, they engaged in war, and both sides committed uh, atrocities equally, and the, the government side could be equally bad. Why did you didn't do anything about government? We we are well aware of this criticism, uh, but. Um, the prosecutor made the promise that uh, as soon as they they uh, would be would find any any evidence in support of government atrocities, then they would do their job. Uh, um, these are the um, the um, probably my answer to the. Um, the African uh, question. Uh, regarding Mr. Gaddafi, actually um, he lodged an appeal before me, so in principle I have to refrain from expressing my view on this, but uh, <coughs> the our, our chambers, uh, pre-trial chambers, um, find Gaddafi case admissible, whereas they found al Senussi case inadmissible with their own varying reasons. And they all uh, uh, have been appealed uh, before me. Um, so it, it, the, the, the case will take its, uh, its own course. Uh, I, um, I cannot um, probably uh, elaborate <laughs> uh, any, any more about the uh, Gaddafi case, uh, unfortunately. Regarding this um, Ukraine situation, you know, Ukraine is not a state party, but Ukraine, this country is very uh, unusual in the sense that while they did not ratify the Rome Statute, therefore not a state party, um, the government ratified agreement on privileges and immunities of the ICC officials. I don't know why they did it, uh, but um, it is clear the, um, the Ukraine is not a state party, so uh, uh, legally speaking, our ICC's jurisdiction cannot be extended to uh, that country, um, probably unless and until uh, UN Security Council would intervene and uh, decided to refer the whole Ukraine situation to the ICC. Um, 
it's an ongoing uh, problem. So it's, uh, on, on that matter too, I would perhaps uh, stop here. Well, I just want to add one uh, remark on the case of uh, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. I can speak a little bit more about this. Um, in the meantime, Saif al-Islam, since the case is admissible, has been declared admissible, should be transferred to The Hague. Why? Uh, a case of non-cooperation was brought in that case. One of the problems of non-cooperation that the court is facing, this is what I want to underline, that the fact that uh, an appeal is ongoing doesn't mean that Libya is not bound to cooperate and to transfer Saif al-Islam Gaddafi to the court. On Libya, um, I, I had to engage in uh, really 25 agonizing days, sleepless days of negotiating with the Libyan authorities to release uh, four ICC um, staff members that um, the Libyan government at that time in my view, illegally detained. And to get them um, back, I visited uh, Libya. And um, Mr. Gaddafi is in the, uh, in, uh, in the, is not under the custody of the central government in Tripoli, but he is in the, uh, under the custody of the Zintani uh, Militia Command. Zintani is two and a half hour drive from Tripoli. When I went there, um, it's, um, it's, it's, a, uh, it, it, my impression was that Zintani area is a separate uh, world from the, from the central government control. They have, um, they mm, repeatedly expressed um, their intention to keep uh, Mr. Gaddafi in, in their custody and unless their demands, a series of demands are met uh, by the central government. Um, so, Mr. Gaddafi is, is not <laughs> under, under the custody of the central government, so it's a bit, uh, bit unusual uh, situation. Well, we've taken advantage to, to sit in, in your lap to just uh, to ask you out of curiosity something that <coughs> is quite interesting from more my, our point of view. As you may know, uh, in this part of Euro Europe, many say today that uh, the European Court of Human Rights is victim of its own uh, success because of the very high number of cases it has to face in this moment. So this is just along the line of efficiency, but, uh, but in the light of the effectiveness of the uh, ICC for the future work. Don't you think that also the ICC would face the same problem? Probably, probably. Uh, but um, <coughs> since the ICC cannot be the policeman for the entire world, we couldn't, uh, you know, just uh, vigilantly uh, watch all the atrocities that are being committed around the world. Um, of course, um, the, since the Rome Statute provides for only three triggering mechanisms, we have to uh, <coughs> uh, uh, operate uh, that way. Um, <coughs> but um, the, as I indicated earlier, um, the 
emergence of the international criminal justice system uh, with the ICC at the center stage would uh, aim to achieve deterrence and prevention. You see, the other ad hoc tribunals uh, you know have to deal with all these atrocity crimes that it after they happened, so post facto, or so or their uh, judgment are simply remedial. As far as the case, uh, we actually uh, deal with it. Uh, our activities are uh, uh, by and large uh, remedial uh, uh, rather than preventive, but uh, by showing an one example, one or a few examples, the would be perpetrators have to think twice before they might commit uh, the atrocities under the jurisdiction of the ICC. Although I have, have yet to give a, a scientific evidence in support of the ICC's deterrence effect, but I did hear a number of times uh, this deterrence effect uh, for example, the Justice Minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo came to me and said, um, in my own country, everybody knows the ICC. And uh, including all the um, uh, political candidates uh, 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 or presidential candidates, uh, everybody. So they are well aware that if anybody would ever commit ICC crime, then they, they would end up being before the ICC uh, proceedings. So they visibly refrained from uh, committing any atrocities. So uh, the, the presidential election they had three years ago, three years ago, became bloodless. They expected in, uh, in the beginning, uh, it's uh, really uh, you know, a kind of bloodbath uh, uh, exercise, a political exercise, but uh, it, it, it didn't happen. He just repeated uh, this uh, statement and just uh, thanked me uh, uh, for that. And uh, on and on, I have uh, some other uh, testimony in a way or statement to the same effect. Um, so I, I, I believe, I'm of the opinion that um, we, uh, the ICC has to uh, uh, focus more on the, on the norm setting in the, uh, in the national system and deterrence and prevention worldwide. Um, I think we are now over. Yes, you want? Is there any? Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. <coughs> I'm David Denti from the School of International Studies. My question concerns the role of the ICC uh, concerning the inter interpretation and development of international criminal law. You spoke about a normative. Uh, uh, role of the court in strengthening the legality and the, the legitimacy and the need to avoid impunity. But the court is not the only actor out there. We had other courts, there's the International uh, Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, and so on. And these actors often speak speak with different voices and give different legal interpretation. So I would like to know whether the courts have mechanisms for a legal dialogue in between them. I'm thinking about, for instance, the latest uh, Sainovic sentence of STY, in which the court for former Yugoslavia refers to the title sentence of the ICC, and in, the in that way, somehow overrides, overrules a former sentence, Perisic, and so on. But beyond this kind of judicial dialogue, is there a mechanism for which uh, judges and members of the courts speak to each other about different legal principles to 
uh, have conformity, have a, a homogeneous interpretation or not, or is this being fought and so on? Thank you. Shall we also take the other question so that we can combine the answers? Good morning, Mr. President. My name is Michele Gagliardini and I'm a PhD candidate in international law at this university. <coughs> I would like to ask <coughs> a general and open-ended question. The crime of aggression has not been mentioned so far. However, the crime of aggression, yeah. However, we know that the court has got jurisdiction on it, that it has been defined, and it that it will probably represent a major challenge in the next future. So my question is, is it too early to discuss it? And if not, would you share with us your thoughts about this peculiar crime and the, the court's jurisdiction? Thank you. On the aggression crime, I uh, have to refrain from expressing <laughs> my, my view on this. It is, uh, it is uh, really... Uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised that uh, all the participating states uh, adopted the uh, definition of aggression crime by consensus in uh, Kampala, Uganda in uh, June uh, 2010. Um, as time goes by, uh, many lawyers outside or inside the ICC uh, are beginning to find some <laughs> legal and other problems uh, in there. But nevertheless, um, uh, there is um, a sort of uh, uh, a campaign going on uh, to uh, encourage uh, as many states parties as possible to uh, ratify this one. Uh, in order to uh, take effect, you need at least uh, 30 free uh, ratifications uh, uh, so far, we reached uh, 13. Um, a, a few days later, I'll be flying to uh, New Zealand to, uh, to, uh, to attend the conference on uh, aggression, crime, and other things. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it is my general impression that it is uh, slowly picking up, slowly picking up, despite some inherent legal problems, I could say up to that point. And then the, on the first question, actually, <coughs> can you imagine this uh, 18 judges are all of my highly respected colleagues. I'm sure they are number one legal professional in their own country for sure, if not in the whole world. Um, and um, we often sit around and engage in uh, discussions uh, uh, on how to interpret certain articles of the uh, Rome Statute or uh, rules or, or regulations. It, we have uh, many such uh, gatherings internally. <coughs> However, everybody has a different legal background, different cultural background, different linguistic background. Every background is different. So uh, sometimes you, you realize uh, the everybody talks of all different things, although the the terminologies they use are common, but their understanding of each terminology, legal terminology, could sometimes be different. You suddenly realize that and uh, uh, try to get back uh, and start from zero and uh, again. And um, we, we spent uh, many hours and days and months uh, to engage in that kind of debate and uh, discussions. But now, oh, overall, um, you know, the for the last 10 years, it's a short period, period of time, but uh, 
I think we produced uh, quite a few um, precedents and um, um, a lot of problems, a lot of uh, the judicial issues are handled uh, in accordance with the uh, already created uh, judge-made law. Uh, so um, um, the I'm happy to, generally happy to report to you that uh, um, you know, we now really understand each other um, when uh, we discuss the, uh, the relevant um, legal instrument together. Um, it, was a, uh, some, it was a problem indeed in the early years, but uh, now it's, uh, it's, we know what the other uh, colleagues are talking about. And uh, very little uh, obstacles and differences. Okay. Um, this has been a really rich discussion. We discussed it for more than half an hour, and I am very grateful to President Son for the availability, not only for the speech, but also for discussing. And thank you also for your participation. We're looking forward to having uh, other occasion to discuss about these issues, and definitely at least the student of the School of International Studies will, because the course of Professor Polito will start, and so the you'll have another chance. But thank you to all the presenters, or thank you also to uh, Mrs. Rosini for coming, and thank you. Good, have a good day. Thank you.